I want to I wanna just tell you a little bit about myself because, well, I just do. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> I did not read a book. I did not read a book until I was 33 years old when I got saved. I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't read. I could read the words, but I couldn't comprehend. So I could not comprehend. Well, after I got saved, I, I just started devouring books. I love to read, love, love it, love reading. But, um, in, let's say, 19, well, not 19, about five years ago, my, my husband and I both got our doctorate degree, in, and uh, his is in theology, mine's in ministry, and I'm getting a degree in PhD. And I say that to tell you this, that you can teach an old dog new tricks. And this clip that I'm fixing to show you, um, it's about neuroplasticity. It's how you think can actually change your brain. So I'm, I'm, I want to play this, and y'all just keep this in your mind about how we can retrain our brain. Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Hence, neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel, or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task, or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. It becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently, learn a new task, or choose a different emotion. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more, and this new way of thinking, feeling, or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. So the more you think about something, the more that it becomes ingrained in your brain. So, you know, you, think, you hear people saying, I've said it myself, the more I think about that, the matter I get. That's because it's being ingrained in your brain more. So, uh, I heard, I read something just this week about anger management. <clears throat> and um, and the, the article said, why do we want to manage anger? Why don't we just get rid of it? And we can. You know, the Christian counseling is the only counseling that can get rid of anger, that can get rid of shame, that can get rid because Jesus paid the price for us to get rid of it. So, that was all free. That that's not even in my paper. Uh, patience is better. Patience is better than better. Patience is better than power, and controlling one's emotions is better than capturing a city. So, controlling your emotions, and, and one of the scriptures says is, is better than a mighty warrior. So, being able to control your emotions is is better than taking over something, taking over a city. So. Um, Okay, you've heard of IQ, you know, your intellect quotient. Did you know you also have an EQ, an emotional quotient? And they they're actually have tests, you can take tests on Londa to check your emotional quotient, which your, um, your emotional intelligence, otherwise known as emotional quotient, or EQ, is the ability to understand, use, and manage your own emotions in positive ways to relieve stress, communicate effectively, emp empathize with others, overcome challenges, and diffuse conflict. Who would like to diffuse conflict? Me. 
who would like to uh, communicate more effectively, me. I think we all would. So how do we do that? So the world's way to, uh, uh, to elevate the e your EQ level is through self-awareness, self-management, social, social awareness, and relationship management. But God's way is to be self-aware, but God-focused and God-conscious. And, so, and ask, okay, what, I, what do you want me to do about this? Or not what I want to do, what do you want me to do? You know, because he's already made a way. <clears throat> okay, what is an emotion? An emotion is actually energy in motion. If you think about it when, you've, you know, when you're nervous like I am right now, your voice shakes, your hands shake. When you're angry, what happens? Your heart starts racing. Just different things. Our body has a physiological, makes a physiological change when we have these emotions. And if those emotions aren't dealt with, then that, then that gets stored in your body, which causes tension, stress, stomach problems, headaches, and all this other kind of stuff. So if we get rid of all that, then we would be healthier people, will we not? So, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. In fear, uh, back when the plant that I was working uh, at was closing, I had been there 27 years. A lot of people had been there longer than me. I mean, that was our livelihood. And they were closing the plant, moving it to Mexico, and uh, they had actually had police in there surveying the place 24-7 because people were angry. I mean, there was a lot of stuff happening. They even put plate glass on the windows because they was afraid somebody was going to shoot into the office. And anyway, it was not a good place. So uh, on my way to work, I was praying and I asked God, I said, okay, God, just help me to react properly today. Act in the right manner if something happens. And he spoke quickly and said, Lisa, I don't want you to react. I want you to respond. He said, chemicals react. And, you know, if you think about that, chemicals do react. And, you know, we're not chemicals. I mean, we do have chemical makeup in us, but he wants us to respond, not react. Okay, and jealousy. Um, this is stuff that I did, I've dealt with. <laughs> Still do from time to time, and I think we all do to a, to a point. Um, in anger, what do we do? Uh, this kind of anger thing kind of be a hurt thing too. You be so hurt, but you're angry or whatever. And I remember about years ago, the same thing started, kept happening again and again and again, and I kept asking God, why, why, why? And what he told me, he said, Lisa, don't ask me why, ask what? What can I learn? What can you learn from this? You know, because, you know, my mama always said when we was growing up that every hardship that comes is for our learning. That's what she'd say. And I'd think, it can't be for our learning. I mean, but it is. Everything that we go through is to teach us something, either about ourselves or about the situations that we're in. Uh, jealousy. I'm going to tell this one on... It's not on Diane, but it's about Diane. <laughs> and this was years ago when we went on a mission trip to uh, Mexico. And me and Diane was real tight. We're still really good friends. But she was, was rooming with somebody else, with Teresa <laughs> Gilreath. <laughs> and I was jealous. I was really jealous. And it started making me sick. And I kept, you know, praying. You know, I didn't want to feel that way. I didn't want to feel that way. And the scripture, confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. So do you remember, Diane, I knocked on y'all's door at one night and I, I just said, I gotta, I gotta tell y'all, I'm jealous. I'm just jealous. And as soon as I said that, it was, it was gone. It was released. I mean, it was, it was so freeing just to confess that, you know? And... um. My headache went away. I mean, I was, I was healed. So we can get rid of this stuff if we just will. You know, sometimes that, we have to humble ourselves. And, you know, that's not always easy. I guess I better move on. All right. Uh, the, four, the first four negative emotions in Scripture, and I'm going to just go through these real quick, was, of, of course, the first one was... Adam was uh, afraid. It, um, 
It says, then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, where are you? And so Adam said, I heard your, your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So right there is not just being afraid, but also shame. I was afraid and I was ashamed, so I hid myself. Uh, and then comes in the blame game, the same, you know, the blame game. All right, then in Genesis 4, 3 through 8, this is where Cain, I'm going to read all of this. It says, and in the process of time, it came past that Cain brought an offer of fruit, of fruit, <coughs> fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the first fruit of his flock of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. He said, but you should rule over it. But he didn't. He didn't rule over it. And what did he do? He killed his brother. So they're out there. It's anger, depression, and jealousy. And God told him to rule over it. He tells us to rule over it. I mean, we have to rule over it if we're going to live the, the life that Christ died to give us. You know, he didn't, he didn't die just so we could survive. He died so we could uh, st uh, not strive, but thrive. And this is another thing the Lord has just told me recently about struggling. He told me, he said, he didn't want me to use the word struggle. You're not struggling, you're striving. And I thought, well, what is the difference? I mean, it's both... And what he said was, the struggling, you can continue to struggle but not have, not have a goal to reach to. But when you're striving, you're still having that, putting forth, having to put strenuous, strenuous effort, but you've got a goal that you're coming to, that you've got ahead of you. Well, that goal is to be more like Christ, to be more like him, you know. So we're striving, we're not struggling. All right, smoke alarm. How many of y'all got a smoke alarm, a smoke detector in your house? When it goes off, do you get mad and just beat it or what happens? Well, what do you do when it goes off? Panic? It's an indicator, isn't it? If it's a smoke, there's fire, right? It's an indicator that's, that there's a fire. Well, smoke alarms, smoke, what smoke detectors are for the house, emotions are for the soul. They are a signal that God has given us to tell us something is not necessarily wrong, but not what we thought it would be. Because a lot of times we think something might be wrong, we might think it's wrong when it's not really wrong. It's just our perception of it. We see things as we are, not as they are. So it's, it's how we see it. Okay, so how do we really use, uh, usually deal with our emotions? We stuff them, and like what I said a while ago, when you just stuff them, you bury them alive, you only create more problems. I mean, because it, like I said, that your emotions, they, they lodge somewhere in your body if you don't deal with it. Or we can override our emotions by distracting, eating, shopping, watching TV, Facebook, we, when we replace negative emotions with doing, then we risk the chance of some type of other addiction, like trading smoking for cigarettes. You know, I mean, all right. Or we can obey them. This is the way the world does. I mean, usually does. So you turn the TV on, do you not see people obeying their emotions? I'll turn on the news. People just doing whatever they feel like doing. You know, even the, in the Word, it says that there was a time, well, people do what they feel like doing most of the time. Uh, okay, the, the fourth one is we avoid whatever's causing the, ne the negative emotion, which doesn't do any good because there's always something that's going to aggravate us, going to try us, going to, you know, tempt us, always going to be something. So we cannot run from those things. Uh, Proverbs 4, 23, it says, Be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. 
The quality of our thoughts will always determine the quality of our lives. All right, have you ever heard anybody say, well, he just knows how to push my buttons, or she's pushing my buttons, or whatever? You know, we're not vending machines. If you push A2, you're going to get this. If you push D3, you're going to get that. You know, we're not vending machines. We don't have buttons, or we shouldn't have buttons. Who put those buttons on us is what I'm going to ask. Who put them there? I don't, God didn't. I promise God didn't put buttons there. All right, the, the next thing is, have you ever been with somebody, you might have done it yourself, I know I have too, and they're on their phone, and you can tell, I mean, texting, and you can tell just by their text that they're getting madder and madder, and just, just, you know, they're being remote controlled. A lot of times we are remote controlled by the enemy, really. Not really by someone else, because the word says it's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. So, do you want to be remote control? You want somebody else pushing your buttons? You want somebody else telling you how to feel? I don't want anybody telling me how to feel. I want, I want to feel the way God wants me to feel. I want to deal with my issues or whatever the way God says. Okay, how do we master our emotions? The first thing, is, and, and Penny, you said it pretty much in the beginning, we got to know who we are. Who are we? Who are we in Christ? Um, that we are, we need to learn who we really are in Christ while understanding we are not physical bodies mastering a spirit, but we are spiritual beings mastering a physical body. Being a master of anything has less to do with the end product and more to do with the process. You know, they got all these things now, life hacks, you know, quick ways of getting there. There's no quicker way of getting there in the kingdom of God. I mean, there's no life hack. Um, we have to go through the process. It's just like breaking, um, like a caterpillar becoming a, a butterfly. If you help that butterfly out of that cocoon, you, you risk uh, retarding the butterfly. And if, if we try to get out of the process, we risk retarding ourselves. So it's a process. You know, I don't know how many times, I counted it once, how many times the, the Bible says, in the process of time, in the process of time, in the process of time. In the process of time, if we'll continue doing this, and like that video a while ago, the more we, the more we do it, the more we... Um, control our emotions, the more we take, take ownership of ourselves, really. You know, take on, we need to take ownership of ourselves, of our own thoughts, of our own emotions, because the, our emotions are ours. They're not anybody else's, they're ours. Um, and I was going to say this, Melanie's Holcomb's not in here, she's... Um, her mom was in a car wreck back several years ago. We really, um, she, it, it messed her up pretty bad. And she was in the hospital for a long time and all that. When she started coming back to church, I was talking to her one day and was, she said, uh, I asked her how she's doing. She said, I'm good. And anyway, what she left me with, and it stuck with me, is she said, I'm not going to let this body tell me what I can do and can't do. I thought, I like that. You know, we shouldn't let this body, our physical body, tell us what we can do or can't do. And we surely shouldn't let other people dictate how I'm going to feel. I mean, we shouldn't allow anybody else to dictate how we feel. I mean, our feelings are ours. Our emotions are ours. All right. Uh, a make up, you've got to make up your mind that you are not going to be led by your emotions, but by the Word of God. A made up mind is a powerful mind. And by, the Bible says more than once a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. And being double minded, if you make up your mind, and I'm not going to do that back, I mean, I used to be so wishy washy, it was pitiful. I mean, I was a wishy washy person. I mean, no, I might do it today, I might not do it tomorrow. I might do it right now, I might not do it 10 minutes from now. I mean, that was about anything. But 
I'm not wishy-washy anymore. <laughs> All right. All right, the four steps of controlling your emotions. Number one is to set your mind. You've got to make up your mind. You've got to set your mind. Uh, we make a conscious and deliberate decision to live out of what we know rather than how we feel. I may feel unloved, but God says I am loved. I may feel useless, but God says he has a purpose and a plan. I may be frustrated or hurt, but God says he will keep me in perfect peace if I'll keep my mind on him. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. I think that's the next slide. It says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in his resurrection from the dead, keep, seek, keep seeking the things that are above. What's above? What does above mean? It means elevated. Keep seeking those things that are elevated. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, not on the things on the earth, which have only have temporal value. So we have to elevate our thoughts above our situation. We have to elevate our thoughts above whatever. I mean, uh, Colossians 3, 12 through 16, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you must also do. But above all, these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. First of all, let me just say, if you would just take Colossians 3 and get that, get it in your heart, I mean the whole Colossians 3, because it talks about loving one another, forgiving one another. I mean, it's if we could just get that in here and do it, we'd be good, I promise you. Um, but it's let the peace of God rule in your heart. That word rule in the word rule in the Greek, it means to act as an umpire, to act as a governor also. But let the peace of God act as an umpire. Is it going to, if I'm starting to get frustrated and aggravated and all that, then am I letting the peace of God rule in me? No. And, and like what... Uh, Jennifer said this morning, we've got to hit the reset button or reboot, you know. And we can start over. We can start over many times. But as long as we start over and not quit, not give up. I've heard too, a lot of people say it's, it's just not worth it. It is worth it. It's going to be worth it. In the end, it will be. Uh, Romans 5, Romans 8, 5 through 8. It says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of, of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually mind, minded is life and peace. So we got to set our mind. There's so many more scriptures about setting your mind on things above, setting your mind on Christ, setting your mind on, on the Word of God. Um, in Philippians, I think I had these other ones. Philippians 4, 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, med meditate on these things. Think on these things. Set your mind on these things. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6, Paul writes, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing, into, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And I've heard people, men, people preach that this is talking about that, like pulling down strongholds in the heavenlies, but it's not. It's pulling down those mindsets those mindsets that we've set up because of, uh, just because of our past or whatever. When I married Forrest, I filtered everything he did through what my ex-husband did. I had a mindset that if my first husband did me wrong, my second husband will. You know, we have to pull the, down those strongholds. And the reason I say it, he's talking about the mind is because he said to bring every thought into captivity. So he's talking about those 
thoughts, those mindsets that we've set up. And, you know, you, you, you were talking about having pretty much back wrong, you know, the wrong mindset, you know, if, uh, about a father or whatever. Or even, what did you say about God, blaming on God? You know, that's a wrong mindset. So that's a wrong mindset. And I've heard people uh, blame God for a lot of things that wasn't God's fault. All right, number two is renew your mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'm about out of time. Uh, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present... To ber I'm not going to read all this because I'm about out of time, but uh, the Greek word in that, uh, uh, transform, is metamorpho, which is... is means to transform. You can change your behavior, but if you don't change your mindset, you'll default right back to the behavior. So we have to change our thought, we have to change our mindset so we don't default back to the old ways. Uh, three, guard your mind. Proverbs 4.23, it says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And the Hebrew word, uh, for heart is L-A-V, love, which is also translated mind, wisdom, and understanding. So guard your heart, guard your mind, guard your wisdom, guard your understanding, because that's where your life comes from. That's where your real life comes from. Our real life is not by our, lived out of our circumstances, our situations. It's lived from within. All right, um, number four, quiet your mind. Psalms 40:16. it says, Be still and know that he is God. Sometimes we get caught up in so much stuff we can't be still. But I promise you, if you'll just sit down and just check out for a minute, go outside, do whatever you have to do and say, Okay, God, just breathe him in. What, what he told me back when I was going through all that stuff at work and everything, he said, Inhale, inhale peace and exhale frustration. Inhale whatever you need and exhale the anger. You know, just breathe him in and exhale you. <laughs> if that, and exhale your thoughts, exhale your feelings. Isaiah 30, 15, it says, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. In quietness and in confidence. We have to be still quiet our minds, and be confident, not in ourselves, but in Him, knowing that the battle's already, already been won. Peace is, uh, Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace, for it, it is trust in you. Actually, the, the King James says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. And I used to wonder, how can I keep my mind on God all the time? Let me think about God. Let me think about God. Let me think about God. That's not, that's not really it. It's thinking about his ways, his word. What does he say about this? Like you said a while ago, you and talk to God all the time. I do too. Some, sometimes I'll be talking to him, my granddaughter will say, who are you talking to? <laughs> yeah. But, you know... We, I mean, it's a constant, if you really have a relationship with him, you'll have a constant dialogue with him. I mean, you do with your spouse or whoever, you know, so. Um, peace is God's protection over our minds. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The Hebrew word for keeping that it actually means to protect by military guard to prevent a hostile invasion. Have you ever felt like you was hostily invaded in your mind, just being tormented in your mind? I mean, I've been there a lot of times. And it's the peace of God that's going to protect us from that. You know, if we can get in his peace, how do we get in his peace? We keep our mind stayed on him. We keep our mind stayed on what he wants, what he desires. Not what I want. 
Because a lot of times what I want is not necessarily what he wants, but I got to do what he, what he wants. It's just like in submission. I hated that word when I first saw it in the Bible. I thought, that's got to be the wrong word there. <laughs> but as I, as I grew more and more in him, I have learned that that is God's way, you know, that the wives be in submission to the husband. But you know what? It says that we are to submit to one another. We are to submit to one another, you know, and not think, it says not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Um, okay, prayer doesn't work until we transfer or release the burden to God. He is well able to handle anything, any of our burdens. You know, if you pray about something, you pray, when my boys were still at home and they'd go out on like Friday night on the weekends or something, I'd, when I went to bed, I'd pray for them, but then I'd lay awake all night long, you know, worrying, when, you know, just wait for them to come in. And when I was praying about it, you know, was praying, after I had finished praying about them and I started worrying about it, God said, did you not just ask me to watch over them? Yeah, I did. You know, am I not good to my word? I mean, if we, we got to release it. When we pray, release it. Release it. I mean, don't just... Keep on carrying it. I mean, yeah, the scripture does say to ask and, you know, knock and all that. But he he's can't work if we're still hanging on to it. I mean, we well, yeah, got to let God be God. Let God be God. If I cast all my care on him because he cares for me, if I cast it on him, cast it means just to throw it, you know. And then I run back over there and get it. Did I really cast it on him? No, I really didn't. So we have to cast our care on him because he cares for us. He cares more about us than we could ever think or imagine. Just, you know, what you spoke earlier, Penny, I mean, he loves us. I mean, we are the apple of his eye. And he does hide us in the shadow of his wings. You know, and, that, and that's what we have to focus on is who we are in him. What he's done for us to, to get us to... The, to live the abundant life. We have to set our mind on his ways and his word and ask the Holy Spirit, okay, what are you, what are you trying to show me here? Is it me? You know, a lot of times, in my, in my instance, it was me, not the other person or whatever. It was my, how I saw things. So, I read something uh, this morning, actually. It said, growth and comfort cannot coexist. If we're going to go grow in Christ, we're going to have to go through some stuff. We're going to go through stuff anyway. I mean, with or without Christ. We're, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. He said, but be of good cheer. I've already overcome the world. And that's been one verse that I've stood on. He's already overcome. Even though, you know, so our hope has to be in him. And I've been hearing uh, the word resilience a lot lately. What is resilience? That's where you keep up and you keep on going, you keep on going, you keep on going. And, and God wants us to keep on going. He wants us, to, he wants us to have the abundant life, but we can't do it apart, apart from mastering our emotions because our emotions will send us every which way. So uh, that last slide, I hope. Control Alt Delete. Do you know what happens when you hit Control Alt Delete on your computer? It reboots. Sometimes we got to reboot, reset, control yourself, alter your thinking, and delete, delete negativity. Alter our thinking according to God's thinking, according to God's ways, according to what His Word says. And here's the thing, ladies. If we don't know what his word says, we're not going to know what to do. If we don't know his word, like the submit thing, that was a big deal for me until I got into the word and found out, you know, why. And that's just the way he set it up. God is a God of order, not of disorder. 